On today's show, the latest rumors and speculation from national media pundits surrounding the NBA draft and as it pertains to the Houston Rockets. Also, the Utah Jazz head coach Quinn Snyder stepping down and how that may or may not impact the Houston Rockets, both in a positive and a negative way. And then lastly, some thoughts from NBA Finals Game 2, all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I also host Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as the founder of ClutchCityControlRoom.com. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. As always, appreciate you for making Locked on Rockets your first listen each and every day. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Check out prizepicks.com, use promo code NBA, or go to the App Store and download the app today. PrizePix is daily fantasy made so easy. For today's show, kind of a melting pot, get us caught up from everything that took place over the weekend in the NBA landscape and things as it pertains to the Houston Rockets. We're going to revisit some news, speculation, uh, rumors from some of the national media talking heads as it pertains to the Houston Rockets, the NBA draft, the offseason. We'll take a look at some of the commentary from guys like Kevin O'Connor, Danny LaRue, uh, Sam Bassini, and Jeremy Wu. Going to take a look at those. Then we'll uh, kind of shift gears to the most recent uh, news regarding NBA front office coaching staff, whatnot, and that's the... Uh, departure of one Quinn Snyder from the Utah Jazz, choosing to step down after eight years with the Jazz organization. What that potentially means and how it could potentially have a cascading effect on the Houston Rockets. And then in segment three, some thoughts on NBA Finals game two. So let's start with these uh, little tidbits, these little morsels of information from some of the national talking heads here. Because we had some conversations. We'll start with KOC because what, what this means is, and where some of this you know is kind of leading me to, is there really isn't a clear consensus yet on the direction that the NBA draft is going to go, right? The Vegas odds point towards Jabari Smith, and a lot of people have just you know been operating under the assumption the top three are going to go chalk, and it's going to be Jabari, then Chet, then Paolo, to the Magic, OKC, and the Rockets, respectively. And still, from the moment that the lottery was decided, I didn't quite subscribe to that notion. Until we see those picks announced on draft night, I, I'm not walking away under the assumption that any given player is going to any given team. And from what it seems to be, based on some of the reporting and speculation here from, we'll start with Kevin O'Connor, is that he's under the same assumption. So KOC recently said, uh, discussing the idea of Jabari going number one to Orlando, KOC said, I don't buy that yet personally, and most of the people I talk to around the league aren't sold on that yet either. So operating off that assumption there, you know, I, I think there is something worth note that even though Jabari is probably the leading favorite to go to the Orlando Magic, there's still room for adjustment, right? There's still a chance that Orlando goes another direction. And so that's why even through this entire pre-draft process, while it feels like Paolo Bencaro is destined to become a Houston Rocket, there's still a possibility that Orlando throws a gigantic wrench into that plan by drafting Chet or by drafting Paolo number one. And at the end of the day, there's such a slim margin between these top three prospects as far as the three bigs are concerned. The Rockets are going to be happy to walk away with any one of those three. It's just been, again, the leading assumption that Paolo Bancaro is going to be the one that falls to number three. KLC then does follow up and talk a little bit more about some draft-related stuff. He thinks that Jalen Green and Jaden Ivey would be the most exciting and explosive backcourt in the NBA, but he doesn't necessarily think that you can survive with those two in the backcourt, seeing the way that teams are flat-out targeting smaller defensive players, especially in the playoffs. And I think that makes a little bit of sense. Um, that said, I don't think Jaden Ivey is necessarily a 
small guard by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, you look at his frame, his body, maybe there's some defensive question marks there. In fact, I, there absolutely are some defensive question marks there, just like there are with Palo. But that said, I don't know if that's necessarily a reason to not draft a guy and have potentially the most explosive backcourt in the NBA. KLC follows up by talking about the fact that his pick for the Rockets is Paolo Bencaro, adding the fact that if Jalen Green improves as a playmaker, which is something that Jalen Green said to Bill Simmons that he wants to improve upon this offseason, then, you know, it could make a lot of sense for him and Jaden Ivey to be an interesting pairing in Houston's backcourt. But again, KOC's pick for Houston is Paolo Bancaro. And it's worth noting that KOC has Paolo Bancaro mocked at number one on his big board. So for him to be, you know, ecstatic about Paolo Bancaro potentially landing in Houston, that's KOC's guy, right? Like a lot of Rockets fans who have Paolo Bancaro mocked at number one. Uh, that's where KOC has him, uh, not mocked, I should say. That's where he has him on his big board. He doesn't have him mocked at number one, though. He hasn't mocked to the Houston Rockets. Another kind of tidbit here is that, uh, SI's Jeremy Wu released uh, released a, another version of an NBA mock draft uh, where he has Jabari Smith going number one overall to the Orlando Magic. However, he has the Thunder taking Paolo Bancaro at number two. And I think that is a bit of an interesting angle. Again, I, I haven't bought into the idea that the Thunder would select Paolo Bancaro at number two, but... Uh, Jeremy Wu goes on to say, you know, history has shown it's not a great idea to make assumptions about what the Thunder are going to do on draft night. And while a lot of the early buzz around this pick has centered on Chet Holmgren, expect Oklahoma City to also take a long look at Bancaro, who fits their ethos with his size and skill, but brings a very different set of strengths. While he doesn't solve the Thunder's defensive issues, he's the most polished offensive player in the draft with a unique mix of power, skill, and passing chops that lets him operate all over the floor as a playmaking player. Fulcrum. He's not a rim protector, but some of the defensive concerns with him are otherwise a tad bit oversold. So this is kind of that that shift in the pre-draft process where we're seeing a bit more, uh, I guess, I don't want to call it leeway, but just we're, we're seeing some other ideas kind of start kind of pouring out. And where there's where there's smoke, there's potentially fire, right? If you've got guys like KOC, if you've got guys like Jeremy Wu basically pointing to the fact that saying, hey, it's it's not a given that it's going to go Jabari, Chet, Paolo in that order for the top three in the draft. I do think there are some heavy considerations to be made here by those two organizations ahead of the Rockets in the Magic and in the Oklahoma City Thunder as to what direction they're ultimately going to go here with their draft picks and how these things kind of play out. I do have a couple more talking points that I want to get to from Danny LaRue and Sam Vassini as it relates to the Houston Rockets and what it could potentially, potentially mean once we get to the faded draft night here just under three weeks away now. But first, we got a quick message from our friends over at Prize Picks because when it comes to Prize Picks, it's basically the easiest daily fantasy option out there for the NBA. You need to check out the award winning app, Prize Picks. It, again, daily fantasy made easy. You pick two to five players and an over under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times back on any single entry. It's just you versus the projected numbers. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Prize Picks is safe and offers fast, fast withdrawals. You can use the award winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Prize Picks even allows mixed sports entries. And for a limited time, Prize Picks has an exclusive no brainer of an offer for all of our listeners. Listeners get $50 for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores just a single point. All you have to do is use promo code MBA. That's right. This is an exclusive offer for locked on listeners only. Sign up today and use code MBA to get $50 for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores just a single point. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, appreciate you for making LOR your first listen each and every day. Right now, we have an important favor to ask of you, our LOR listener. We put together a survey so we can learn more about listeners like you, make your favorite Locked on Podcasts even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and what you don't like about Locked on Podcasts. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It won't take very long, and everyone that completes the survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 100% Ticketmaster gift cards to take our audience survey. Go to lockdownpodcast.com slash survey. We appreciate it and thank you for your help. Now, before we get into the news of Quinn Snyder's departure from the Utah Jazz and what that could mean for the Houston Rockets, both in a positive and a negative light, 
let's wrap up our news here as far as just uh, some of the rumblings about the NBA draft. Uh, let's pivot here to Danny LaRue and Sam Vecini. Danny LaRue sharing the fact that Jabari Smith would be number one for him. However, he does have Paolo Bancaro over Chet Holmgren. He does believe that any of the three bigs are good fits for the Houston Rockets. Sam Vecini follows up to say that he has Jaden Ivey over Paolo Bancaro in a vacuum, quote unquote, but would take Paolo over Ivey for Houston. He doesn't necessarily like the fit of an Ivy Green backcourt. Again, I think there's there's definitely some pros and cons to a potential Jaden Ivey, uh, Jalen Green backcourt. You also run into some of the same question marks about a backcourt like that, similar to some of the same question marks that we've seen that have sprouted up with Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green in the sense of, you know, KPJ, Jay Nivey, neither of them are traditional point guards by any stretch of the imagination. And I do think that there's maybe a model where you look at the NBA now where you can kind of play make by committee across multiple positions on the floor. And you don't necessarily need to have a de facto traditional point guard. I mean, shoot, look at the two teams in the finals right now between the Boston Celtics and the Golden State Warriors. Neither of them have a quote unquote traditional point guard, right? Both teams play make by committee. I mean, it helps having some of the greatest shooters of all time if you're the Golden State Warriors, but even the Boston Celtics, right? Marcus Smart is not a traditional point guard, right? He is a, you know, stellar defender, kind of a three and D mold almost, but, you know, he can do some of the playmaking, you know, for the Celtics. They also run a lot of sets through Jason Tatum. Jalen Brown can kind of play make a little bit. So can Al Horford. They've got Derek White off the bench. They do it by association, right? Everybody kind of helps out a little bit in that regard. And they just rely on, you know, a heavy dosage of ball movement to get things going. So maybe that's the way the NBA is trending and it wouldn't necessarily matter. Uh, but I digress here. I, I do find it interesting that they talk about, or that the scene talked about in a vacuum when discussing the potential fit and having Jay Ivey over Paolo Bancaro, because I do think that especially at the top of the draft, when you've got prospects that are this like close to one another, as far as their, their talent level, and there's not like a clear separation, a clear margin between any of the top prospects, I think. I do think you start kind of factoring fit a little bit, right? And we saw the Houston Rockets, right? Last year, they had the choice between the, you know, athletic guard and then the, you know, versatile big man. This year, they've got another decision to make, right? Between the the versatile big man and then like another athletic guard. And it kind of makes sense for the Rockets to maybe hedge their bets a little bit, go the opposite direction, go with a Paolo Bancaro over Jaden Ivey, not only because he might be, again, arguably a better prospect, even though I've got them, you know, very close to one another at this point, as you know, as I've kind of been reflecting on my analysis of these top prospects, you know, I think that it just makes more sense, right? If you've already got a dynamic guard presence in Jalen Green, you know, why not bolster your front court a little bit in Paolo Bancaro and have another guy kind of fulfill another need elsewhere as far as your roster is concerned, that kind of thing. So I do think it makes sense once you have like to, to factor in fit just a little bit at the top of the draft when they're, when these prospects are that closely, you know, packed together as far as their talent is concerned. Now, Couple other pieces here from Danny LaRue and Sam Vecini uh, as it relates to the Rockets and not the NBA draft. And that's that uh, Danny LaRue thinks there will be plenty of interest in Eric Gordon and Christian Wood, but places Eric Gordon's value at a late first rounder, Christian Wood at less than a first rounder. So maybe this kind of matches uh, some of the trade value in our recent uh, you know, market evaluation episode for Christian Wood. Maybe that matches why some of the you know proposed trades were just not super on the money for Christian Wood. Maybe his value is less than a first rounder currently around the league. And then Vassini followed up by saying he doesn't necessarily like Christian Wood's game, poutiness, defensive efforts, but believes that there are some teams that would be interested in taking a flyer on him. And that's basically where the Rockets are at with Christian Wood is you know, one year left on his deal. Yeah, he's a walking 20 to 10 guy, but his defense is rather suspect. You know, what can you truly get for him in the way of a trade? And there's a lot of Rockets fans who are like, why would you want to trade a walking 20 and 10 guy? And it's like, well, you know, he hasn't shown much aptitude defensively. And there's definitely some question marks moving forward about what this roster is going to look like if you do take a Paolo Bencaro and you have Wood and you have Shingun and you have Garuba. And a lot of Rockets fans are ready to just move on and have Alper and Shingun, you know, have him have a legitimate shot to be the starting five moving forward and just see what that pairing could or potentially could or 
you know, potentially not bring to the Houston Rockets as far as him and, you know, another big from this draft, be it Paolo or Chet or Jabari, whoever may fall to the Rockets at number three. So with that, I do want to talk a little bit about Quinn Snyder stepping down with the Utah Jazz, uh, the second winningest coach in Utah Jazz franchise history behind uh, none other than, of course, Jerry Sloan. Eight seasons with the Jazz, Quinn Snyder, easily one of the best coaches in the NBA. And, you know, I don't want to say like we saw this coming, but the Jazz, two back-to-back first-round exits, you know, very much, you know, tons of questions surrounding Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert. Can those guys coexist? Do the Jazz need to trade one of them and move on? Who do you hold on to if you're the Jazz? Do you keep Rudy? Do you keep Donovan? Who's the guy that you, you know, choose to build around, whatever? A lot of question marks for this Jazz franchise, and I did kind of wonder, like, okay, if they're going to hit the reset button, right, do they reset? Do they try to find maybe a different voice, a different edge in the coaching department? Is that what you do? It's, it, but it's really hard to move on from one of the best coaches in the NBA and feel like you got better as an organization. So right now, I think the Jazz are kind of at a crossroads, you know, with, as an organization to see what path they choose to take here, right? First off, it depends on who they bring in as a replacement head coach. Uh, Johnny Bryant, who is a guy who's had some connections with Donovan Mitchell, uh, you know, a close relationship with him is kind of the favorite name, I think, right now to bring in Donovan Mitchell, kind of throwing his weight around as a star within the Utah Jazz organization, I think, trying to leverage himself into where he has an abundance of say in who becomes the next head coach. But if you're the Jazz, do you do you feel confident in this iteration of your team, right? I mean, this iter- this version of the Jazz has fallen short multiple times now. Do you really think there's a coach out there that A, can get more out of this team than Quinn Snyder? And then B, you know, even if you do feel that way, how confident do you feel in the roster construction as it stands to r- really make a significant push in the West when the West looks like it's going to be even better next season? So if you're the Jazz, I think there's an option here where they might choose to reset, right? And they could sell off, you know, the, the, they could, they could, you know, get rid of Rudy Gobert, right? See if they could bring back assets for him. Same thing for Donovan Mitchell, who I think is even, even more of an enticing prospect for a lot of teams around the league, especially when you look at where the draft is at right now. And the team that keeps eyeing me in the face is a guy like, you know, Donovan Mitchell going potentially to the Sacramento Kings, right? You look at where the Kings are at, the fact that Jaden Ivey, Shaden Sharp, maybe neither of them make exactly a ton of sense next to a De'Aaron Fox if you're Sacramento. But if you could trade, say, number four and like some salary filler for Donovan Mitchell and then the Jazz get a chance to completely reset, you know, get a younger timeline, pick up one of those top prospects, like that could be an interesting route if you're the Utah Jazz. And what that means for the Houston Rockets is if the Jazz decide to suddenly blow things up in Utah, then that's another team that's going to be you know, vying for probably a, you know, a top pick in this next year's NBA draft and probably bottoming out this upcoming season. Do we know that's the direction they're going to go yet? Not yet, but it's worth noting that again, this could be a team that's going to be, you know, competing with the Rockets possibly to sell off parts to kind of hit the reset button as an organization. And it's just a possibility that's on the horizon. Maybe it's not something that happens right now this offseason. Maybe they hire a new head coach and they struggle to start this next season and they decide to start mortgaging their parts at the trade deadline, right? It's just another team that could potentially be competing with the Rockets as far as teams that are interested in, you know, acquiring assets, you know, trade partner, whatever. So that's something to work, you know, something worth considering from the Utah Jazz angle. And then, or just as it, you know, as it pertains to the Rockets. And then the other side of things is, you know, Quinn Snyder, as reported by Mark Stein, is planning to take about a year. He's going to take a year off. He's going to step away from the game for a little bit. He's been coaching for eight straight years. You know, again, the last two ending in some kind of disappointing first round exits. If you're the Utah Jazz, this is easily one. Quinn Snyder is now the top coach on the free agency market, period. Like there's not a better coach out there than Quinn Snyder. And if you're the Houston Rockets, the way the timeline is potentially syncing up here. Now, Stein did report that there's interest, right, potentially from the Lakers and from the Spurs to, you know, procure the services of Quinn Snyder when he is ready to come back and coach an NBA team. That could potentially sync up if you're the Spurs. Uh, if Greg Popovich decides to step away after this next season, that's an opportunity for the Spurs. The Lakers, they've got Darvin Ham, you know, new, fresh faced, eager to try and, you know, salvage the situation in LA right now. Um, It'll, you know, remains to be seen what LA manages to do with Russell Westbrook, with LeBron, AD, all of that over there. 
But I think it's worth noting that the Houston Rockets could be an intriguing destination if this next season doesn't necessarily pan out with Steven Silas. Now, I still have high hopes for Steven Silas. I really do as far as being the guy to figure it out you know, as the head coach for the Rockets and sticking around for the long term. But this next year is critical for him. And not necessarily in the sense of like, oh, the Rockets need to be in the play-in tournament or Steven Silas is going to be fired. But like, you know, I feel like there needs to be a sense of moving movement in the right direction, right? We kind of got that sense of growth at the end of this past season, right? When Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr. started to explode, have their big performances at the end of the season, we felt kind of good. Like there was a good foundation, something to build upon moving forward. And I think a big part of that was there was some clarity about, okay, it's all the young guys playing now. There's no more veterans soaking up these minutes. And if that trend continues in the proper direction this next season, then I don't see why this team couldn't continue to take some steps in the right direction. And, you know, that confidence continue to grow with Steven Silas and what he's trying to accomplish here in Houston. That said, if next year doesn't exactly go according to plan, if it doesn't feel like those strides are being taken in the right direction for the growth of this Houston Rockets team. If Jalen Green and whoever the Rockets draft at number three, maybe Paolo Bancaro, right? If they show flashes of talent, if they look like an exciting, young, dynamic duo that is ready to take the NBA by storm in the coming years, why wouldn't you want to be a part of that, right? Like the Rockets are poised to have one of the most, if not the most exciting young core in the NBA between Jalen Green and whichever top prospect they walk away with in this year's NBA draft. And if Jalen Green takes another leap this next season, like if he takes that sophomore leap and looks damn good next year, then that's got to, the Rockets have got to be an enticing destination for any free agent NBA head coach if they decide to move on from Steven Silas. So Quinn Snyder in Houston, a possibility, maybe down the line, it's worth noting that it's at least a possibility. Nothing reported yet, nothing, you know, concrete, but the way the timelines potentially sync up for, you know, the Houston Rockets for Quinn Snyder, it's at least it's at least worth considering a possibility. So with that, want to get to some thoughts on NBA Finals Game 2. We're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Built Bar because when it comes to protein bars, you got to check out Built Bar. They're the number one protein bar on the market and for very good reason. Every single bar is covered in 100% delicious chocolate. They're not gritty or chalky like other protein bars on the market. Every single, I mean, they've got incredible flavors too, is the, is the other best part, right? Because the flavors don't even sound like you're talking about protein bars. They sound like you're talking about delicious, luxurious desserts from some fancy dessert gallery somewhere. You got raspberry, strawberry, mint brownie, coconut, peanut butter, cookies and cream, salted caramel. I can just go on and on and on. My personal favorite is coconut brownie chunk, but you really can't go wrong with a single flavor on their menu. Every single bar is low cal, low sugar, high protein, high fiber. Amazing. If you're on a keto diet, amazing. If you're trying to cut back a little bit, lose a little bit of weight, you can check them out. Just go to built.com. Use promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your very next order of the best tasting protein bars on the market. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, appreciate you making LOR your first listen each and every day. For your second listen, go check out the Locked on NBA Big Board podcast. Host Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and author of the NBA Big Board newsletter is joined by Richard Saman, Sam Ferris, and Leif Thulin, giving fans an in-depth look into the NBA Draft, Mock Draft, Player Rankings, and of course, Big Board that's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Now, some unrelated well semi-related to the Rockets thoughts here in the final segment um just NBA Finals game two uh Boston Celtics got absolutely demolished by the Golden State Warriors it was a game that was close at halftime it was just a two-point contest at halftime and this was despite the fact that over the course of this game uh, well, first off, the Warriors had one of their infamous third quarters, right, where they just absolutely exploded 35 to 14 fourth quarter. And in fact, the Celtics actually kind of weathered the storm initially from the Warriors. It was like a six point game with about four to five minutes left in the third quarter. And then that reserve unit from the Warriors kind of started to check in and especially Jordan Poole caught fire. And that's where the Warriors were able to just do so much of their damage and really create a substantial lead and kind of coast to the finish line in this game. Now, I will say that as far as this game is concerned, the Boston Celtics did not do themselves any favors. They didn't shoot the ball well from inside the arc. It was and like it was a, a rough all-around game from the Boston Celtics. You had Al Horford, Rob Williams, and Marcus Smart combined for six points 
in their starting lineup. That's just, that's not enough to cut it. Al Horford just one of four didn't attempt a single three pointer. The golden state warriors did a phenomenal job of taking away the three ball from Al Horford. Uh, Marcus smart, just, you know, not impactful at all. Offensively one of six shooting missed all three of his three point attempts, uh, a far cry from what happened in game one for the Boston Celtics, where they had guys like Horford step up and have a career game. Derek White step up, have a career night. They had tons of contributions across the board, and you have to give credit to the Golden State Warriors for taking away a lot of those opportunities for the Celtics. They shot 15-37 to from behind the arc, 40.5%. But inside the arc, they missed a ton of easy opportunities. And where where a significant takeaway from this game comes from is, um, you know, I... I called it out during during the game because we had Steve Javi come on at one point uh, to discuss the altercation between Draymond Green and Jalen Brown that took place, you know, early in this game. Now this was after Draymond Green had already received one technical for his little interaction altercation with uh, uh, why am I blanking with Grant Williams? Right? Yeah, Grant Williams it was, and. So Draymond Green already had one technical and there was this moment where Draymond Green kind of undercut Jalen Brown on a three point attempt a little bit. They both fell to the floor. Draymond was, you know, landed in such a way that his legs kind of were draped all over Jalen Brown's like face and chest area. And so Jalen Brown kind of like knocked him away, said, get off. Draymond Green took exception to that and they went back and forth, right? For a brief moment. And in 99% of other games, right? This would be a double technical straight up. Like, you know, two guys, altercation like that, double technical. Easy, easy enough solved. But Draymond already had the one technical. And so a second technical would have meant an ejection for Draymond. This is where I feel like a lot of NBA fans are, like, they they differ. And I'm, and I'm curious to know your opinion on this. I, I want to know, let me know in the YouTube comments, because I do feel like this is kind of a uh, hot button issue for debate as far as the NBA is concerned. Steve Javi came on the broadcast and basically said that referees use selective enforcement when it comes to technical fouls and the decision-making process and how to apply the rules in a moment like that. And that basically it boils down to the fact that the refs knew that Draymond already had one technical. So they view the second technical as not a second technical, but they view it as grounds for an ejection. And to me, that's the dumbest thing that I've ever heard in my life. To me, a technical should be a technical, right? Doesn't matter whether it's your first technical, or your second technical. If you do something that's warrant that warrants a technical, then that should always be the case. Now, this has been, unfortunately, first off, it was, you know, Steve Javi kind of saying the quiet part out loud, right? Which is something that we've all kind of come come to understand, right? When a player, especially a star player, maybe picks up their fifth foul, they get a little bit more leeway, right? It's really hard for a star player to pick up their sixth foul unless it's just like blatantly obvious that they picked up their sixth foul. Remember to last year's NBA finals when Devin Booker had five fouls and fouled about three or four more times over the course of the final minutes of, I forget which game it was, but it was atrocious because Devin Booker was playing with five fouls for the remainder of that game and got away with a lot of contact that he probably shouldn't have. Same case here, as far as the technical foul is concerned. To me, it doesn't make sense. To me, it's a little confusing as far as the rules are concerned. I'd rather things just be called the same way all the time. I never enjoyed the notion that you call the game a certain way in the regular season and then like the referees whistles, you know, quote unquote, tighten up in the playoffs and they allow more contact. They allow more physicality, whatever. It's the same thing we saw with James Harden for years, right? Where he would get a very favorable whistle in the regular season and then suddenly the referees would swallow their whistle in the playoffs and he wouldn't get the same calls that he would get and it would lead to a lot of frustration because a lot of his game was based on baiting for fouls and at times playing more for the foul than playing for an actual bucket, which was frustrating in its own right. I mean, I complained about that many a time on this very podcast, but it's the double standard that really throws me off as far as like the amount of a leash that Draymond Green gets with the officials because no other player in the NBA gets that level of like freedom when it comes to complaining, barking at the officials, the, you know, uh, overt gestures was a hot, you know, a, a buzzword that we used a lot uh, two seasons ago with the Houston Rockets as it relates to Eric Gordon and, and Boogie Cousins and guys like that. It just doesn't make sense to me, right? And Draymond's went after the game and said, that he's earned differential treatment from the referees. And I don't think that's a great thing for him to be like, it's just, it's just a bad look for the NBA in general. And I think especially there in game two, Draymond 
you know, was committing fouls upon fouls upon fouls. I mean, at one point he looked like an offensive lineman, just straight up like blocking players and pushing them out of the way to clear up openings offensively. You know, there was one point where he just completely trucked over Grant Williams and Grant Williams was called for the foul. And so while I, and this was my, this was my take on the initial situation as it, as it pertains, right. You know, I don't, I don't subscribe to the notion the NBA rigs games per se at all. I think that's complete tinfoil hat conspiracy, but there's a certain double standard for certain teams and players. And the selective enforcement at key points is absolutely atrocious for the game of basketball. And I do think that the NBA absolutely knows what it's doing in that regard, as far as the selective enforcement of certain calls, why they let certain players get away with certain things, why they, why we see, you know, on a game by game basis, game one, Felt like it was ref pretty fairly. It did. Game one was probably one of my favorite playoff games of this entire playoff se- of this entire postseason because it really didn't feel like the whistle went one way to- or the other too terribly. Like fouls were just called what they were. And at the end of the day, that's what I would ultimately like to see in most NBA games is I'd like to see just a fair whistle both sides. That's it. I just want to see consistency too, right? If you're going to call the game tight, call it tight on both ends. If you're going to call the game, you know, really loose, call it loose on both ends, that kind of thing. But the subjective nature of officiating and the subjective nature of this selective enforcement that Steve Javi went live on the NBA broadcast and basically said, yeah, we use our judgment and we kind of like bend the rules here and there, depending on certain players, moments, whatever, even though this was in reference to the technical fouls and how they issue them there. It's not that it's not like too much of the stretch of the imagination to think, Oh, well, the referees probably also apply selective enforcement elsewhere in the game they wouldn't just use this logic as it applies to technical fouls. And so I think that kind of is just a slap in the face to a lot of, a lot of NBA fans, fan bases, uh, as far as just when you think you're getting like screwed over by the refs, it's very, it's legitimately probably real. But at the end of the day, the Boston Celtics didn't lose this game because of officiating. It definitely didn't help. And I think that's my key takeaway here that I want to end my point on is that even though I don't think the NBA like rigs games with officiating, they can definitely tilt a game in the favor of one team versus another. And I think that is something that actively happens legitimately because at the end of the day, if a team has its own autonomy to where if the Boston Celtics were to shoot, you know, 75% from three and not miss any of their shots, right. There's nothing the officiating can do to like close the gap there. Like it just, it just wouldn't happen. Right. Very look game seven, Phoenix suns, Dallas Mavericks, right? The suns just completely dropped the ball in game seven. And the Mavericks were absurd in that game. There was nothing an officiating crew could do to even like, like lessen that margin. Right. At one point that game was like a 40 point blowout. Like that's not going to happen at that point. It's pretty much a lost cause. But that said selective enforcement and ignoring certain calls and key moments, allowing extra contact, whatever, allowing certain players to get away with things on the floor that they otherwise wouldn't be allowed to get away with can turn the tides in the favor of one team versus another or can slow down momentum for one team versus another. And I think that's my most the most frustrating thing when you try to bring up this type of a concept, first on, on social media, on Twitter, because there's only 280 characters. You can only explain yourself so much, right? The referees don't, you know, they, they can impact the game. They don't ultimately decide the game. But in those types of key moments, right, where it, it, a lot of fans, they when you complain about officiating, they boil it down to like, well, look at these two. So-and-so team had this many free throws and this team had this many free throws. It's not about the free throws, man. It's not about who's attempting the most free throws. It's about calls that are not made. It's about calls that are ignored. It's about contact that is let go. It's about those little things that take place over the course of a 48 minute game that tilt the favor to towards one team, right? The amount of crap that Draymond Green gets to get away with throughout the course of a given game, like he like in this game too, he should have had like 12 fouls and like four technicals by the end of the game. But he didn't. He got away with a ton of stuff. And credit to Draymond Green for knowing that he can get away with it, right? He understands that referee, he's built this reputation for himself, and now referees allow him to get away with a ton of contact, a ton of stuff that nobody else would be able to get away with. But that's the selective enforcement. That's the, at, you know, at some points, that's favoritism for an individual player that allows him to have an inherent competitive advantage over his peers. So this is like a rambling, like just diatribe here in this segment, but I, you know, shared my thoughts about it on social media, didn't get a chance to elaborate further on it. I wanted to elaborate further on it here because at the end of the day, like, I don't think the NBA is fixed. I don't think it's like wrestling. You know, that said, I do think there's certain levels of 
enforcement that happens and that the referees are maybe kind of the quality control assurance for the NBA to make sure that, hey, like, we don't want Golden State down 2-0 going all the way back to Boston. That'd be terrible for branding, for, you know, people tuning into the finals, all that stuff. Maybe extend the series a little bit, that kind of thing. So it does kind of sound conspiracy theory-esque. Maybe I'm just, you know, completely off base here. But those are just my madman rambling thoughts. But with that, that's going to do it for today's episode. Our very next episode will be the draft profile on Chet Holmgren. Don't want to miss out on that. Be sure to let me know what you think about the officiating in the finals in the comments. Of course, Rockets fans definitely have some thoughts about officiating as it relates to the NBA and Golden State in particular. I didn't even get into any of the 2018 drama because I don't think I need to. I don't need to revisit that wound for Rockets fans. But with that, that's going to do it for today's episode. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, the brand new Odyssey app, free and available on all platforms. Also, check us out on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.